Hi, Nancy. Hey, Shane. Welcome back. Thank you. From vacation. So were you on a cruise by any chance? <laughs> I was uh, I was not on a cruise, actually. I was uh, actually in the desert hiking the Grand Canyon rim to rim. Oh, sweet. That is, sounds awesome. Which is very different. Um, but I have. I actually have been on a cruise before. Uh, I went with my family uh, for, what was it? My parents' 40th wedding anniversary. The whole family went. Um, and it was actually lovely for all the things that people say about cruises. I actually had a quite a lovely time. Where'd you go? Bermuda. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I have never been on a cruise. No. However, um, you know, Richard, my boyfriend, is really into metal music. There is a metal cruise. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gears in my head were turning so quickly. I'm like, where is she going? Where is she yeah, going? Yeah, it's like five days of just bands, constant bands, metal. It's called like 70,000 tons of metal or who, something. <laughs> who puts it on? Is it like a Royal Caribbean metal no, cruise? I don't even know. I don't even know. But I'm like, I've, I've somehow sort of agreed to this. I'm not sure if I really Wait, want to go through with you're it. You're going? We haven't, no, we haven't signed up, but I'm like, I'll be fun. Like maybe for his 50th birthday or something. When, like, when does this happen? Where does it go? It goes to, like Caribbean or something. Yeah. Yeah. And like and like the cool thing is you can like be behind the scenes with all the bands because you're like just chilling on the boat with the bands, man. If this ever happens, <laughs> we are revisiting this <laughs> and you are taking so many pictures because this is going to be amazing. Um, anyway, very different from <laughs> anyway. the type of cruise that scientists go on, however. Yeah, there is actual there is actual setup to this. Uh, so then you have been on a research cruise, right? Yes, I did a very short one, like off the coast of Oregon, which was which was definitely awesome. Definitely. Our episode this week, um, we talked to someone who has been on many cruises, yes. research cruises. Yes, we have. Probably not probably not a metal cruise though. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hamlin. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right. So we're talking about um, vacation cruises, but there are different types of cruises that scientists do, right? Yeah. I mean, they actually go, they call them cruises, but they're... They're not. They're work. I mean, they yes, they have a little bit of fun, but it's mainly fun. work. Mainly work. Yeah. Mainly work. Research so, cruises, they call them. Right. Yes. And we're talking about this, so we're going to bring in uh, Lauren Lapuma, who uh, talked with a scientist who does, or at least in her past, has done many research cruises. So, hi, Lauren. What up? Uh, and what do you got for us today? Yeah, so a couple of months ago, I met Dawn Wright. She's a scientist, and she works at the Environmental Systems Research Institute, also known as ESRI. She's also a professor at, of oceanography at Oregon State University. And what does she do? Well, right now, Dawn does a lot of science policy, science strategy work. But early in her career, she worked on mapping the seafloor. And actually, the way that Dawn got started in science is that she went on several, actually many, ocean research cruises, or expeditions, I guess you could call them, with the Ocean Drilling Project, uh, known as ODP, which drills sediment cores from the ocean floor. And their goal is to kind of reconstruct the past geologic history of the oceans. So I finished my master's degree at Texas A&M University in 1986. And around that time, Texas A&M was the science operator for the ocean drilling program. And so they were staffing uh, the Joides Resolution drill ship with staff scientists and marine technicians and facilitating all of the operations, the logistics, and so forth with the science parties going out on those uh, ODP cruises. Uh, when I finished my master's degree, I got hired by ODP as a marine technician. And it was very exciting for me because my first cruise was Leg 113, which went to the Weddell Sea, uh, Antarctica. And so I was out uh, with, with that science party for two months, uh, in late 1986 and into 1987. I had um, I'd only been to sea once before on a student training cruise in the Gulf of Mexico. So to go from that to two months in the Weddell Sea in Antarctica, it was just, it just blew my mind. It was just amazing. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It was just such a great adventure. And I ended up doing nine other cruises uh, with the ocean drilling program as a technician mm -hmm. and I decided to go back to school for my PhD so I had about three years of going to sea uh, with ODP and it was awesome. Each of those uh, expeditions, each of those cruises was amazing uh, but the Antarctic ones I think were the most memorable. So, uh, so the ocean drilling program 
uh, takes, and now the IODP takes uh, samples, uh, cores of sediments and rocks from the ocean floor, mainly to reconstruct the past history of the oceans. And in the case of Leg 113, what we were trying to do was to reconstruct the paleo-oceanographic history of the Weddell Sea. Uh, we were looking at the, uh, the past movements of the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, looking at uh, processes such as uh, ice rafting, uh, sedimentation rates, uh, just trying to discern what went on, uh, particularly uh, in the, uh, the, the Cretaceous uh, period uh, in that part of the Southern Ocean. Mm -hmm. So we were getting all that information from the cores of sediments uh, that we were able to drill at, I believe it was nine sites. So how does the process of drilling an ocean core work? So it, it's probably a lot different from when I was out 30-some years ago, but the, the general principle was you, uh, you lower this drill pipe down to the seafloor, uh, you uh, anchor it onto the seafloor, and you have this uh, drill bit at the end of the drill pipe that rotates and then uh, kicks up material as it gets deeper into the sediments. Uh, that material gets collected into a barrel that is lowered through the drill pipe, and that barrel gets filled up with that material. When it gets filled up, then it gets pulled back up to the sea, to the ship uh, by a wire uh, full of that uh, ocean sediment. Uh, the, there is a, a plastic uh, sheath within the barrel uh, that is extracted, and then that's what the we as technicians work with in terms of splitting uh, that core and then running all kinds of tests on the core uh, with the science party. Uh, the drill barrel uh, goes back down to the seafloor to get more material as the drill, the drill pipe uh, is going deeper and deeper into the sediment. So you just keep doing that over and over again until you get down to uh, a layer uh, where it, it's just not feasible to go any deeper or I guess it, it depends on the scientific uh, objectives of that particular cruise, and in our case, we had nine sites to drill, so we had to spread out our time over the two months that we had at sea. Mm -hmm. So each time you get to a site, um, so how long are you there? So kind of tell, take me through that process of you know how the re you know getting down on the ship to the site, and then what happens when you get there. Well, if you if you want to take a, a core from the seafloor, you you have to take into account the water depth. So if you're trying to to drill in um, a couple miles deep of water, it takes time to get that drill drilling assembly, what they call the bottom hole assembly, down to the seafloor, get that all set up, and then again, it depends on how deep you want to get, how much sediment you want to collect at that particular site. So you may be on a site for, for several days uh, to a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and the danger there is that you're anchored uh, in, in the seafloor over that period of time. So for us being in the Antarctic, basically an iceberg alley, uh, we had to have some type of safety uh, support to ensure that we weren't hit by icebergs or bergy bits while we were anchored in the seafloor uh, getting our, our, our cores. So how do they do that? How do you provide that? How do you have that safety? So, so for us, and from what I remember, we had the Maersk Master, which was a support ship that was basically there to lasso icebergs and drag them out of the way, out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> and those guys, uh, it was a Danish ship and I'd never met a crew of sailors who were so excited about their job. They just thought that they were the, the best because they, they were basically there to keep us from, from danger. They were like superheroes on the high seas. Wow. I certainly thought they were. They were awesome guys. They were really friendly. They would come over and visit us. They would send a, a Zodiac or a small ship, a small little boat to come over and, and visit us from time to time. But... They were basically following us around throughout the entire two months, and they had to calculate how far away a particular iceberg was from us, and taking into account uh, the winds and the, the speed at which the iceberg was traveling, and of course its direction, they would determine when they would need to intervene. And so when, the, when an iceberg would get 
into the danger zone, into this buffer zone where it might affect us. They would steam up to that iceberg. They had this huge, humongous rope. It was basically a rope that they would drop over the side right at one point of the iceberg. They would steam around, letting out the rope as they went until they encircled the iceberg and they would pick up that rope and then literally, like a tugboat, tow the iceberg out of the way. <laughs> and so if you were, if you were, um, if you were on break or you weren't um, uh, on your shift, and it was really fun just to go to the side and see them in their operations because they were, there were so many icebergs or bergy bits uh, that were in our vicinity throughout those two months that they were continuously in operation. So you could always see them towing an iceberg. And so how long does that take? Well, it took them several, it, it, I think to, to get each of those icebergs, it took them several hours, and it really would depend on how big the icebergs were. And as I was telling you before, there was this, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know whether it's in the Guinness Book of World Records, but they made a big deal uh, about this iceberg that was approximately the size of the Texas A&M football stadium. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> at the time, Texas A&M their football stadium was called Kyle Field. And they calculated this one iceberg, its volume was probably, it could have fit inside of Kyle Field and filled out that stadium. Oh, wow. And that, it, it took them many, many hours to, to deal with the Kyle Field uh, iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just doing this continuously while you guys are anchored there and drilling. Yes, yes. Now, uh, we had nine sites that we drilled. So during the time that we would, pull up the bottom hole assembly, bring up all the drill pipe onto the deck, and move to another site. Uh, that was, of course, transit time where they didn't need to support us. They would just follow along mm -hmm. and wait until we lowered the pipe at the next site and were, again, anchored in the seafloor. Mm -hmm. And then they would continue to just uh, circle around us and just keep watch for the icebergs that might pose a danger to us. Another nice little uh, thing that happened on that cruise with those uh, Maersk Master, uh, uh, with the crew, a couple of them were, were really into making pottery and making things uh, just out of the, out of clay. I don't know, they had a, a kiln or an oven. I don't know how they were able to actually make little sculptures, but they took some of the sediment uh, from the seafloor, and they created uh, little uh, clay penguins and whales and dolphins and things, and, and they painted them, and they gave them to some of us as gifts. And I still have my little deep-sea sediment penguin. Uh, there's a picture of it on Instagram, <laughs> so I can send <laughs> you so the link. But it's just, it was so precious. <laughs> yeah. So precious. So you guys had such a good relationship then with these guys. These yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were a really happy happy bunch. Nancy, you mentioned previously that you've been on a research cruise. What was that like? Yeah. So like like Dom was talking about, it was awesome. Um, it was great. We were just off the coast of Oregon for a few days. But one thing um, that yeah, you may not realize. Of course, you're on there with the scientists, but there's this whole crew. I mean, just as many folks, and they help everything get done on the ship. I mean, they couldn't do it without them. I filmed the chef, who's incredible. It cooks like a whole meal. In this little galley kitchen. What did Just, you? What did you do? What, what did was your I do? Yeah. What was your At job? Social media. <laughs> <laughs> Tough. How did you, get, did you get internet out there? Yeah, there was internet. We were actually close to the shore enough, but the internet oh, is cool. pretty slow. But So that was a little tough. I helped them with the sampling by the end. Okay. You know, just general. All right. You know, you know. And I, yeah. How was how was uh, how was the actual like how were the waters how was the how was the seas did you get seasick or anything Oh, so that's a good thing because we actually it was the whole thing was it was a cruise in the winter off the coast of Oregon. Most people don't go out in the winter; it's really rough. Ooh. And I had the patch <laughs> behind my ear, but man, there was one day when we were in the trough, the trough. I'm not gonna say it right. Trough, <laughs> trough, trough, trough. Where you're like going across. It was, I mean, people, ever, a lot of people, even people have been on like hundreds of cruises, they had to go downstairs and lay down. Like it was, we were just sitting there watching a movie, just like not looking at each other, <laughs> not talking, not eating for like eight hours. Wow. Yeah. I remember that for most of our drilling operations within the wet LC, uh, the, the seas were, were pretty, pretty calm. Uh, it wasn't too stormy. The main thing that we were in danger from uh, were these icebergs, but... We had to get to our first site by leaving uh, Punta Arenas, Chile, 
at the southern tip of South America and going across the Drake Passage. So it's that it, that uh, passage of very rough seas between the southern tip of, Antarct of uh, South America and then the tip of uh, the Palmer Peninsula in Antarctica. And those were some pretty rough, stormy seas. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, it was... It was like being in a winter wonderland because it was always cold. Uh, I remember wearing long underwear the entire time, the entire two months. <laughs> Not the same pair, of course, but <laughs> and that the sea life, there were lots of whales and seals, albatross, uh, and they would come right up to the drill ship, right up to us, anchored mm -hmm. uh, on site. So that was just amazing. Wow. Just to have these uh, the, the sea creatures come right up to us, it was great. Did you ever get um, kind of I don't know what the word is really, but like sick of being out there? And you know, towards the end of the cruises, you know, you're there for two months. I mean, did you ever was there is there ever a point where you're just like, I get me off this boat right now? Yeah, I never experienced that. There were a lot of people who went through that, but I just loved being out there, and I never uh, I never got tired of it there. Of course, with any with any research cruise, uh, you're you're doing repetitive tasks. Our our shifts uh, on the drill ship were twelve hours on, twelve hours off, and uh, when you're out there for two months, there's a, there can be a lot of boredom. You're eating the same things in the galley. The quality of the food in the galley goes down. You run out of movies to watch, but none of those things bothered me. It was like I was on this. Uh, I, had, I had dreamed of going to sea as a child, and I read all of these things like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and pirate novels, other pirate books, and uh, I just, it was just fantastic. So I never, I never got tired of wearing the same clothes over and over again. <laughs> so it, for, for me, it, it was really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I just learned a lot about that, that culture. It's a, it's a separate uh, culture out at sea and you've got to be very respectful of it mm -hmm. be respectful of the of the captain and the uh, the the pe people who are senior than you uh, and you have to have a lot of humility and be uh, open to learning a lot and working hard making sure that you know your role and that you can contribute and and pull your weight I hope for yeah. for any uh, oceanography student that you get a chance to go to sea uh, early and often because mm -hmm. there's just nothing like actually being out there collecting the data and the people that I was out at sea with have become lifelong friends if you can step off a ship after being at sea with someone and you're their friend that's pretty significant and uh, there's some wonderful relationships or enemies too, I guess. But in my case, it was all positive. Yeah. So uh, I really hope that everybody, everybody in the ocean sciences gets that experience. So yeah, it's. it's I mean, I could totally understand what Don is saying. So I was on this research cruise just a few days. I was on the research cruise. I was on the research cruise <laughs> just a few days. I'm a real oceanographer. <laughs> but I mean, we had so much fun in those few days. But these guys have been going out. They're on a big project, and they these guys have been going out on cruises together for years. Mm -hmm. And they have T-shirts. Oh, no. they have T-shirts that they, they made say? that were like commemorating different like times they've gone out oh, together no. and projects. They know each other so well. They know all the music they play. They know how people act. What's I mean, they know like you really get to be tight with. The, I mean, you're on a little tiny boat. I was gonna say you have to get along, right? Yeah, yeah. you have to get along, or mm -hmm. be it would be weird. Maybe the three of us could take some lessons from them. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if I could Oh my God, I, us on a research cruise. I don't think that would work very well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just limit it to our time on the podcast. <laughs> all right, folks. Well, that's all from Third Pod with the Sun. Thanks, Lauren, for bringing us this story. And of course, to Dawn for sharing her work with us. And uh, the podcast is also produced with help from Josh Spicer, Olivia Ambrosio, and Liza Lester. And thanks to Adele Coleman for producing this episode. AG would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us on iTunes and listen to us wherever you get your favorite podcasts because um, hopefully we're one of your favorites too. <laughs> or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. All right. Thanks all. And we'll see you next time.